At this point, we spent quite a bit of time on system activity statistics, things coming out of slash proc. We've been using both SAR, PM chart, PMG SIF, and we've also been going into raw files, in particular proc mem info, to understand how the system is being used, how busy the different resources are. Then we started getting into workload specifics and looking at top, PS, things like that to figure out what applications are running. We have not gotten any time yet to actually get into baseline statistics yet because we really don't have enough data to get a baseline yet. So in particular, I'm hoping that Floyd 3 can get PBS installed. And I want to start stacking up jobs and get a couple hundred jobs worth of data to take a look at. Then I'm going to drop into SPV and start looking at my uh, data that I've been collecting and start getting a baseline. And once I've got that baseline, I can also set up threshold alarms, like context switches and system time and things of that sort. So I've been going through health of the system metrics for three days now particularly proc mem info, I consider it critical to understand how the cache field is broken out in top, understand dirty, right back, NFS unstable. I want to come back to some of that I.O. tomorrow. So health of the system, then the quality of service metrics is what I started pushing on today. So I was going into the PBS accounting data. I was going into the CSA data. And in lab, you have the time command. Also got PBS up and running. And I've got jobs that are in that guest jobs directory that you could just submit if you, want, if you don't want to do things by hand. And in those jobs, I also have the time command to give me time information. The hard part for me when I get to a site is if I don't have CSA accounting, if all I have is PBS accounting, I don't have enough information. PBS is not telling me how much system time it has, and it doesn't tell me how much I.O. it's doing, and it's not tracking any CPU weight, memory weight, or I.O. weight. So the hard part for me is getting elapsed time components. So if somebody calls in and says, my job took one hour once, eight hours the second time, I don't know the elapsed time component differences. I just know the time to solution for the jobs. And that's where I liked using CSA data because it got me into CPU weight, memory weight, swap weight, and the get delays command could get to trim weight. And I even had my own little command called task logger that could attach to a process and print out data. Now, Mike, I was not worried about that JA situation that you have on uh, Floyd 1 right now, but we can take a look at that later. But JA was giving me a job economy report at the end of the job, but I can also go back into the CSA data with the CSA com command and look at per process data. So health of the system, quality of service, and in my analysis, I'm trying to get my top users and top programs. So just before break, I was going through the nine jobs that I've given you, job uh, code one through code nine, to give you an idea what they are. Some are big CPU, some are big memory, some are big I.O., some read, write, read, write, read, write, some just write. One is metadata intensive, one is an MPI application, and one is using Shemem. So each of those jobs are meant to create noise and pound on different types of resources. In fact, for timing purposes, my code two, I removed all the print statements so that I don't have any I.O. associated with code two such that it is all pure CPU work. So from knowing the top users and top applications, I want to try to fix the application first. So I want to list common application tuning steps. I want to move from the GNU compiler. Now, right now on our system, when I was looking just before break, code 2, GNU, no optimization was at 100 seconds. Then there's going to be a lab step for you to go from an optimization level 0 to an optimization level 3, and that program will go from 100 seconds down to 20 seconds. 
But now I'm going to move into the Intel compiler. I'm not going to do that as demo today. I want you guys to install the Intel compiler, fix the module command for it, and then start running code 2 with the Intel compiler. And that thing should go down to like 10 to 12 seconds from 20 seconds. Again, when I'm doing this, I want to run multiple runs. I'm not going to just take one run and say that's my timing. So that's what I'm trying to do right now is stack up multiple runs. I only had two samples so far. I want to get 20 or 30 samples and get a what's called a confidence interval, get enough data to see the trends. So my Intel compiler should drop it down to about 10 or 12 seconds. And in the process, you've already started looking at the module command. We need to get those working. We're going to have a module command for the PBS and a module command for the Intel compiler. And I'm going to be installing another package. I'm going to have you installed NCSA's perf suite. And that will also require a module file to be set up. So the module command I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. The main thing now is I want to start profiling. So if I know this program is at 20 seconds with optimization level 3, I now want to start profiling, getting a line number out of the program, and also getting into hardware counters. So block counting, there is an exercise to do call stacks and to do a profile guided optimization. Most of the profiling I have been doing up till now has been sampling. I've been using the perf command to be able to get to my uh, program counter for my processes, and I can, with perf command, be able to look at uh, uh, subroutine names where I'm spending system time, for example. Perf record-g was the only way that I would have spotted that defrag compaction problem that was causing me 50% system time. From line numbers, I also then need to get into the hardware counters, and we have something called PAPI. It comes from University of Tennessee, Oak Ridge, Tennessee uh, area. Performance API. What this is is a hardware software agnostic. In other words, it is independent. doesn't matter what software or hardware you have underneath. One of the things people always hated, I'd go run a class and have to tell them, you need to use this command for this machine and say, why can't I use the same profiling tool on everything? So PAPI was implemented in both SLES and Red Hat standard nowadays, and it is going into an interface called PCL, Performance Counters for Linux. And PCL is a Linux community solution now to get to hardware counters. And at the same time, they developed this perf command and that is a standard Linux profiling tool. But perf is not getting me down to line numbers. I want to get to the do loop where I'm spending my time. So I need to get into PS run to be able to get down to my line numbers. Now, again, there, there may be other tools people are using to profile. Uh, B-Tune is common. There's Tao. There's a couple other packages out there. But uh, uh, in a batch environment, in my personal background, I still prefer the NCSA, NCSA Perf Suite package. I can run it on Apple. I can run it on Cray or IBM, and I still have the same interface. The hardware and the OS underneath might be different, but I'm still able to use what I know from a Cray and still look at a SGI system with it. So we are talking single CPU optimization today. So first of all, this is where I left off. Know your workload. I didn't have enough data to go into SPV and start plotting it, so I was just using the CSA COM command to get my CPU, my memory, my disk. Is it buffer cache intensive? Is it using IPC? Is it doing network I.O.? Find your top 10 applications. So the PBS accounting data, or CSA, also has uh, top command usage information. So CSA CMS has reports in VAR CSA sum. In fact, let me jump off here, share my desktop.
going to go into Floyd 3. Now, first of all, I've got data already. Let me just do a CSA com. It looks like my timestamps are okay here. Looks like my clock is off a little bit. Uh, looks like I'm eight seconds off. Network time protocol would need to be configured to be able to get my times more accurate. At least I'm on the right year and the right day right now. So I am collecting data. In fact, that date command should be visible to me now. In fact, there it is right there. Now, one thing i got to warn you about, in order for CSA to work, I have to execute that PAM module, and PBS is not PAM aware. So when I submit PBS jobs, they are not going to get a job ID for CSA to work. A couple releases ago, they removed the hook that they needed. It was just two lines of code that would have given a PBS job a unique job ID for that thing. Without that hook, I can't really do very good CSA accounting. You have to have a job ID, and again, when I edited up and uh, D, I added this stub in here such that when I come in through a PAM service, I get CSA. But coming in through PBS or things like that, I won't have CSA data. So I do have data out there, but I'm just going to go into var CSA. There's a day directory here. This is where my data is. Don't need to worry about this, but this PX0 is for jobs that have not finished yet. It's called job recycling. So I kind of carry the accounting records around until the job is finished. And this is my active file right now. This is what CSA.com was printing out. Let me just copy that thing so that I have it somewhere. And I'm going to do a CSA run now. Let me check mail. Not sure what that is. That's from yesterday anyways. Uh, I'm going to go up a directory and into the subdirectory for summary. And what I just did with the CSA run command was generate this report. <coughs> I also have two binary files. That's binary, and this command summary is a binary file. Let me take a look at this report here. So let's see. This is from 226, close to midnight, to 227, uh, current time, 1030 in the morning. <coughs> Hmm, on this system, doesn't look like I have a whole lot of information right now. Root, use 10 seconds of CPU time. And man, some sort of man database, man DB going on. And one of the problems here now is <coughs> job recycling. Uh, let me go back into this. I still have jobs that have not terminated yet and they're not going to show up in the report. <coughs> then I've got my command summary here. Right now I'm primarily looking at about 1,400 commands during the last run. They are sorted by, uh, I suspect, them to be sorted by this one here, but it doesn't look like it's sorting that way. Uh, looks like it might be sorting on mean CPU time. So here I've got the command, number of times it was run, how much memory it used, how much CPU time it used. Again, I don't have much CPU time showing up here yet. Average memory sizes, hog factor, and also vice read and written. I want page down. That is for the current run. Here's all the users. And then uh, there are 115 interactive logins. Again, with PBS having removed CSA support, you won't get anything here anymore. Let 
Now, I'm going to do a CSA period report. Dash R will remove my scratch files. So now let me go up into the fiscal directory, and I've got a report for everything. Let me take a look at this one here. This would be normally at the end of the month. So now adding everything together, I've got 206058. Still not seeing guest up here yet, not sure why. Again, if I didn't do it through uh, a interactive login, I'm not going to have a job ID and won't get anything. 2658 commands, and again, I'm not seeing my workload. I'm not seeing the uh, code 1, code 2, code 3 type of things. Let me try something else here. Dash A for ASCII. Oh, unknown record type. Hmm. Oh, hang on a second. I need to specify it's a binary file, too. Dash S. Let me try it again. A for ASCII, S to say that it's already in a consolidated report. There we are now. And again, I am not seeing my code examples in here yet, so I don't really have any good data. I want our CSA com dash n on code. They're not there anymore. I'm a little surprised I'm not seeing them here. But they apparently didn't. Well, doesn't make sense to me. We did see them with CSA com, but they're not showing up in the summary report. Hmm. Uh, what can I do here? Let me go into VAR, CSA, Day. They are gone from there now. Let me go into Temp. They are showing up there, huh? I'm not sure why I'm missing them right now. Let me go into VAR, CSA, uh, SUM. Let's try that CSA CMS-A-S on the CMS file we have here. And it's not showing anything there yet either. Okay. Let me get out of here in a minute. The other thing I can do here, by the way, is should be a dash E for extended. Let's see if that works. Type into more. And now when I do the extended report, there's my processes, but I now have high water memory marks. I got logical read and write system calls, so I can see that I'm reading more than writing. I got my system time separated out. I've got the page faults available to me. I've got IO wait times in here. Here's my CP wait, my disk wait, my swap in wait. So I get a whole bunch more statistics available to me in a summary. And I would often like to put this into a pie chart. Now, the only reason I might be still missing data is that uh, the jobs haven't terminated yet. So they're, they're showing up in the VAR run, I'm sorry, VAR CSA day directory. They're probably still in this file here. Let me do a JSTAT-A, and this shows all the jobs. These job IDs have to terminate before we see it in the report. Let me try something else. Dash 
Next up would sort, combine, sort. Capital A causes all jobs to be considered. And it will only work on what's called a super record, so that's not going to help me either. I did not put in uh, user actives to be actually able to save my data off. So I'm kind of screwed there right now. What I needed was a uh, what's called a session file or a super record, which is all the accounting records sorted and merged. Anyway, let me get out of there. Let me go back to the presentation. So I was trying to actually get this stuff, but because of job recycling, I was not able to see my data yet, and I just don't have enough data yet. Again, top is, will show what's currently running. Focus on the applications that dominate the system. Find your biggest CPU, biggest memory, biggest I.O., and then kind of buddy system, a help desk, and application support staff. And before I start doing this, I want to do a sanity check and say, is what I'm seeing correlating with what you think? Are we on the same page? Are we seeing the same thing? So this is a sanity check to say, this is what I'm seeing. What are you seeing? Can we compare notes? Now, bottom line for us, the notes that we compare, care about is code two. I want code two shortest wall clock time. That's where we are. So first of all, we want to let the compiler do the work using compiler options. Uh, right now we're at 100 seconds with no compiler options, and once I get to an Intel compiler, I should be in the 10 second range. I want to profile the application and talk about single threaded problems first. I want to get down to the line number in code two, find the do loop where we're spending all of our time. And for single threaded applications, the two key things you need to deal with are cache misses and TLB misses. The number one problem you should be looking for and dealing with is referred to as a stride one, such that when I load a array into my cache, I load it in 64 byte chunks and I want to work with all 64 bytes in cache before I go on to the next thing. This cache stride one issue is also referred to as rows versus columns. Fortran and C lay out their arrays in different ways. So if I am in a row fashion, as I process my elements in the array, they are across the cache line in a row. But if I go into a column type of arrangement, I'm going down the column. So I might load a 64-byte cache line and then only work on eight bytes for a float and throw away the other seven voting point items around that cache line. Everything about these systems is to get into the cache and stay in cache and resolve everything in cache. I do not want to go off cache. If I can get everything to stay in cache, I don't see NUMA. I don't see memory contention. I get what's called a super linear speed up. So we're going to talk about some of the different things that we can do about cache misses. In order to do that, I have to go into the hardware events. So tomorrow in demo, I'm going to start profiling and finding out what line number am I taking cache misses. So these hardware events are coming off the processor. Now back in Itanium days, we had a tool called Histex. And Histex was only good for Itanium, was written for SGI systems only. Nowadays, we are using PS Run. And I need to get into these hardware counter events because I can look at 32 of them at the same time. Something called a Perfex report. Perfex was a command that we had in IRIX that went in and looked at 32 counters at once. So some of the counters I'm looking for, stalls are where the polling point function unit is busy from some other application. Branch mispredicts are going to be bad. I load up my instruction pipe. We need to talk about that in this section. And then suddenly a, a, a do loop changes its conditional branch. We branch out of that do loop, and now everything in the instruction pipe is thrown away. I also want to look for cache misses and TLB misses. So there's going to be some 
key hardware events that I want to get to the line number and find out what line number am I taking all my TOB misses on. Then we get into multi-threading. That'll be tomorrow. So tomorrow's going to be a big day with OpenMP and MPI. And I also need to get into NUMA tools. So everything about these systems is to lock me down, and with D-Place, I'm going to pin myself to one CPU only. I don't want to let the CPU scheduler bounce me around. I don't want to be in CPU 3, warm my 18 meg cache with data, and then get moved to CPU 10 and have to rewarm my cache with the data again. I want to lock my threads down, each thread getting their own private CPU. I'm going to use CPU sets to keep everything away from me and then D-Place to pin me down. Also, there is a wrapper to D-Place called OM-Place. And OM-Place is a little bit fancier and can do things for OpenMP, MPI hybrid applications. Now, D-Place and OM-Place only deal with CPU affinity. They do not deal with memory affinity. So you, we also are going to have to look at memory affinity. One of the other things that's going to slow me down, this code 2, I can get to 9 seconds. If I start going across the interconnect to another blade, that 9 seconds can go up to 15, 16 seconds. Almost uh, twice the time to do the same calculation because of latency. Tomorrow, then, I need to get into the two common multi-threading problems. So, again, for single-threaded, we want to talk about cache misses and TLB misses. For, for multi-threaded, we want to talk about barrier synchronization or load balancing. Again, I like to equate barrier synchronization to be the threads playing phone tag with each other, basically checking with all the other threads saying, are you done, are you done, are you done? There are two ways of synchronizing barriers. One is a spin barrier. So this I'm just sitting there on the phone calling, are you done, 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 are you done? And a spin barrier will show up as user time. And SGI's MPT does spin barriers. So I could be spinning on a barrier getting no work done and still 100% busy. Intel, both their OpenMP and their Intel MPI do yield type of barriers. With that, they sit there, are you done, are you done, are you done? And then they yield the CPU with a sched yield system call, letting the CPU scheduler give that CPU to somebody else. So a yield type of barrier can show up as system time. Watch for that because I'm going to get you. I'm going to start throwing barrier problems at the system, sticking spin barriers and sticking sleep barriers or sked yield type of barriers. The other common problem, and there is a lab exercise for this, is false cache sharing, also referred to as a hot cache line. This is when I have multiple processes writing to the same cache line. False cache sharing is when I have to use the NUMA link CC NUMA directory memory. If I write to a cache line, my hub is going to go to directory memory and figure out what other CPUs have a copy of that cache line on their core, on their CPU, and then the hub will send an intervention invalidation to the hub that has the CPUs that are sharing cache lines. Instead of telling every CPU on the system, rewarm your cache line, we only tell the CPUs that actually need to rewarm their cache line, hey, I just changed something, rewarm your cache line. And I want to profile on that stuff. So tomorrow I've got a Pi program, Pi good, Pi bad. The thing about false cache sharing is I may want to pad things and push some of my variables onto separate cache lines. So if I modify a cache line, I don't have eight objects on that cache line that are dependent upon the change that I made. We'll talk about that tomorrow. I like to compare false cache sharing to be like a marathon run. The gun goes off, the runners start running, but they're so tightly packed to each other, they're tripping on each other's feet. They're stepping on each other's toes, and it's very hard to run fast when you don't have a clean foot and people are tripping you. 
False cash sharing or a hot cash line will get worse as the number of threads gets bigger. By the way, Code 2 has both false cash sharing and barrier problems in it. There is a third problem in Code 2 as well. One of the things the code is doing is called an equivalence. It's, e it's equating arrays. And the equivalence in the routine or in the program is causing a copy of one array to another. And this copying of the array is starting to show up, particularly when the interconnect is busy and the copy is going across NumaLink. So I want to start watching for that too. Then we need to get into data placement. Everything is about locality. I want first touch, local access, lowest latency possible. But there are times that I want interleave. Now this goes back to my story I gave you at the beginning of the week, the Ferrari School Bus 747. I want locality when my payload can fit. If I can load my file and allocate my array space without trimming the file, if both the data and the array can fit on node, that's what I want. I want locality. If I cannot fit it on the node, then I need to start doing some sort of round robin or interleave concept. That is a bandwidth solution versus a latency solution. But again, interleave could be bad. If I have 256 sockets out there, I'm not going to want to spread files across all 256 sockets. That's going to drive up the interconnect traffic and create contention on the NumaLink. Another thing that would be bad, let me jump off to my uh, system here for a second. have, when you create CPU sets, there is a memory spread, which is an interleave within the CPU set. This is going to spread the page cache, like when I do a write, it's going to spread it across all the nodes in the CPU set. And this one's going to spread the slab across all the nodes in the CPU set. There is a SGI in a script that is added in here. CPU set utils is where it's coming out of, it looks like. And when we boot the system, that's going to put a one into these spreads. That means I am going to do all my I.O. or all my slab and metadata activity is going to get spread round robin across the nodes in the CPU set. Now that's going to hurt latency. I got a site that's running Oracle 1024 CPUs. They turned off the spread so that everything is first touch. But they also have to be careful that Dev Shemem doesn't start sucking up memory, creating a, a memory leak on a node and then going off node. So what I'm trying to say here is if I write a file and the spread page is a one, my data is going to spread across all the nodes in the CPU set. So if I am on a system with no CPU sets configured except the global one, when you load SGI's foundation, this CPU set util automatically creates the CPU set by adding in this line here and then mounting it. And then during boot, we set this to a 1. So now if I'm on a 256 socket system, and let's just say I'm on socket 4, and socket 4 is on blade 0, the base I.O. blade, the CPU map, we can see where the sockets are. So I've got a socket 0 here and a socket 1 here, that kind of thing. And then socket 2. These are actually the virtuals. Uh, anyway, and then here's my individual sockets. 
So if my base I.O. is here and I'm running a program and I am on socket 9 with my data and I do a write, it's going to spread the data across all the sockets in the CPU set. So let's say I'm on socket 9 and I do a write and my data goes off to socket 15. And then the flush daemon comes along and says, okay, it's time to flush it. And it's going to flush it from socket 15 back to socket 9 where the base I.O. and the disk drive might be. So now I'm shuffling data around. So let's say I got pinned and my program is on uh, socket 20. I write a file and some of that file gets written to socket 256, round robin, interleave concept. Now I'm going across the interconnect doing lots of hops, dropping my bandwidth because of it, increasing my latency because of it. So now my buffer that was written from the user space is written to the page cache on socket 256. Then the flush daemon comes along and says, okay, let's write it to disk now. And the flush daemon says, well, your disk drive is on base I.O. back at socket 9. Now we're moving stuff from, you know, socket 9 to 256 back to 9 and just bouncing data around on the interconnect. That would be bad. So there are times that you want to turn off this interleave or round robin. Now the reason that this was set to a one in the past was, let's say the app, we're on a uh, 16 gigabyte socket. I come in, read a 10 gig file, and I suck up 10 gig of memory on that socket because it was first touch originally. I would read that file straight into that socket into that node. Then my program starts allocating memory, and the first thing it does is throw away the file that just read in. So in the old days, we'd get into the trash situation, read the file, grow, trim the file, read it back in, read, trim, read, trim, read, trim, read, trim. You don't want that sort of thing. In that situation, your cache is upside down. You're doing more physical I.O. than logical I.O. because you can't hold the file on that socket, on that node. So in, this was Itanium days. They stuck that spread to a one to be able to spread this file across to reduce the pressure on an individual node so they don't get into a trim thrash situation. Let me go back to the workbook. So by default, your file I.O. is spread round robin interleave. And there are times that can be bad. By the way, in that example of me being on blade or node 9, writing to node 256, and then possibly going back to blade 9 for the I.O., XVM is smart enough to find what's called the affinity path. It will not do a round-robin scheme like multi-path would do. It will find the closest HBA, the one that has the lowest latency, the least hops to get to it. So if, for example, I'm on 9 and the data gets written to blade 250 or socket 256 and there is a HBA and a fiber channel interface on that blade, I don't have to go back to whatever socket I've determined through a round robin concept. I will go out the socket that is close to me, possibly on the same blade. This is one advantage of XVM over multipath. Multipath is not affinity aware. Okay, anyway, after you deal with the CPU time, after you deal with the multi-threading problems, after you deal with affinity, then you worry about your I.O. If you remember earlier, I was talking about that one K-byte I.O. from S-Trace was unfriendly. And with I.O. staff the other day, we saw lots of little I.O.s being sorted and merged into large I.O., but right now the most common, friendly, well-formed I.O. IO would be 64K. The bottom line here, if it is an XFS file system, let's see here, EF, XFS underscore info on slash SCR, this is well-formed I.O. 
these blocks are in 4K byte blocks. Let me bring up my calculator. So I've got a strike unit of 64. So let's take 64 times 4096 blocks. That is a 256K byte request. So any I.O. I do is going to get blocked or chunked up into 256K byte requests. Now, if you remember from Monday, the scratch file system, the LUN was two drives that were striped. And those two drives had a segment size of 128. So this S unit is matching the stripe width of the LUN. Now, we brought up SMEE GUI earlier in the week, saw that we had two data drives and a segment size of 128. So this is matching that. That is efficient. And then when we look at this, this file system is built for a 512K byte request. Since it was uh, 256 here, double it, a 512K byte request would get broken up into two 256K byte chunks, and then the RAID controller would break up that 256K byte chunks into two 128K byte chunks, and I have good, friendly blocking, chunking, segmenting my data from the application out to disk. If I do direct I.O., DMA I.O. of 128 blocks, that will be efficient, friendly I.O. And by the way, the application, let's first of all do a man XFS CTL. The application has to know how to use this to be able to uh, get that information. I might be on a system with two different file systems that are built with different stripe topologies. Let me go into YAS. I need to get an XFS development package loaded here. install that. This is the one I was looking for. Let's see. It's downgrading XFS probes for some reason. Uh, I'm just going to break the dependency. I'm not sure why I have a discrepancy coming off the Novell update servers, what it looks like. But I'm going to break the dependency. I don't really care about it right now. I just wanted the man page for you. So we're talking about friendly I.O., an application has the ability with an XFS CTL system call that's there now. It can go in and do an XFS CTL system call and get information about something. So, for example, the one I was looking for was this XFS DIO info. So the application can make this XFS CTL DIO info and then get the memory alignment and the recommended request size information to do friendly I.O. So an application could be running at three different systems, three different sites, or even on the same system with three different file systems, and then try to figure out what is friendly I.O. That's how it's being done. This is what's returning the information that came out of that XFS info report. That is how the application can read this information. If the application is not using XFS CTL, this stuff is not relevant. Okay. I don't know if there's any questions right now. I'll come back to I.O. later in the week. But the best thing would be to do a direct I.O. 
bypass the page cache, and then do I.O. requests that are in stripe width sizes so that strace would show a 512 kbyte request, and then that would go off to XVM and get broken up into two 256s, and then the rate controller would break that up into two 128s, and that would be efficient payload delivery. Any questions right now? So let me get out of here and move on. We'll come back to that. So compiler choices, most people using GNU are doing it for portability, cross-platform type of stuff. Most of ours, I'd say 90% of our sites are using Intel compilers. Uh, Intel has the advantage of being ahead of the other compilers, particularly with the newer processor. If we're going to Ivy Bridge right now, the Intel compiler will know more about what we can get out of the processor. But usually the Intel compiler will have special directives to turn on new features in a given processor. In lab, you're going to load the Intel compilers into slash SW. Also, I'm going to need the Intel compilers. I need all three of you to get the Intel compilers uh, installed overnight, or I'm going to have to install it on FOIA 3 in particular tomorrow morning so that I can start doing OpenMP. And I'm going to use the dash parallel option on Code 2 to convert Code 2 into OpenMP multi-threaded application. Intel bought the Cook Associates preprocessor that will go through your source code and automatically add in OpenMP directives so that I don't have to do it myself. The GNU compiler does not have that capability. The GNU compiler can understand OpenMP directives, but does not have a dash parallel autotasking capability that will automatically add OpenMP directives. Now let's get back to that tomorrow. Also to warn you, the Fortran for GNU is off on the SDK. We are also seeing people using the Portland group compilers that is probably more common like the AMD processors that we're shipping. And the original SGI MIPS compiler, now known as the Open64 compiler, that's out being used out there as well. Now, I don't know, it sounds like each of you have had a little bit of module command background. The module command originally came from Sun, its purpose is to change my environment variables to be able to use a particular product. I really, really, really hate the registry. I don't like things coming into the Windows registry and mucking with it for something for me. Putting everything in the registry makes the registry a mess. We get dangling objects in there. Constantly have to clean up the registry for performance reasons and also have to worry about fragmented registries and contention on the registry, stuff like that. The other thing that I don't want to be doing is changing dot files. I don't want to have everybody changing their dot bash RC. And by the way, this is something that I hate that the SMC product is doing. It's dropping in a SGI bash RC file to hard code loading the Intel compiler path. Now I've got every user with their own tilde SGI MC type of uh, bash script that starts on init. And now if I move a product, I've got to go off and have every user change their dot bash RC files. By using the module command, I have centralized it to one file and one administrator. And that one file could figure out if I'm on Itanium or x86. It could figure out if I'm on uh, Linux, Irix. It could figure out what release, what hardware, what software, and then load in the proper path for the proper product that I want. And if I don't need the product, why have it in my path? Why have my bash RC and things like that automatically adding into my path? One of the tuning things you do is try to clean your path up. You can get into quite a mess where something in your path is contended for, and every time you do a command, you have to go into that path directory to, to search for your command. 
And if an NFS directory is top of my path and the NFS is bottlenecked, I'm going to have contention and problems because of that. So the module command centralizes everything, makes it easier for the administrator to maintain things. The key environment variables is changing are right here. So we modify our path, our library path, and our man path. And again, if I don't need the product, why have it in my path? Use the module command to load that path. We also have a couple of variables for include files and stuff. So the module, oh, let's see here. Got to be careful here. Modules. That looks like the Red Hat name. We'll find out here. Red Hat and SLES are subtly different in their module package. Now, SGI included the module package in MPT because MPT expects to use it. So the module package is usually off on the SDK, and we wanted to save time not having to have them add the SDK to be able to load MPT. But the module package on Red Hat is spelled uppercase modules and it should be lowercase module environment on SLES. And this, by the way, is a SLES path. If I'm on Red Hat, it's an uppercase M. So to me, this is a typo. So again, i got to load it if it's not there. It is part of the performance suite in the MPI to save time. So I do a module avail, and then it shows the modules that I can have. And you're going to want to get three modules in place, the Intel module, the Perf Suite module, and the PBS module. And again, avail will show me what I got, and then I can do a module load to get the particular product. On our uh, benchmarking machines, you may have 30 or 40 different modules for each flavor of Intel compiler. Okay, here's a module file. It is written in TKTCL or Tickle. So a function is called a proc or a procedure here, delimited with the curly braces. And then this one, set is creating like uh, the seashell, setting the environment sit. Brackets are saying execute and substitute. So it's going to do you name sys name and substitute that and set sys to whatever the system name is. I'm also setting my own variable. I'm calling a compiler path and pointing to where I want my compiler. And then I'm saying if my system is Linux and if you name exists, then I'm going to get my machine type from you name dash m. And if I am in an x86 environment, then I'm going to append at the beginning of my path and at the beginning of my load library path, this path here. So I'm also appending to the man path. So this is a simplistic module file example. I'll debug them tomorrow when we get into that in more detail. Uh, I should warn you, let's see, hang on a second. installed on them already. Let me try something else. I'm just going to a nice system. Doesn't look like it's booted right now. When you install a compiler, when it's done, it's going to print out the path for a script. 
to in bulk to get your environment variable set up. Uh, I'm not going to worry about this. Let me worry about that later. Where else would I have compilers loaded? No, I don't have them there. Nope, not there either. I'll have to save that for tomorrow. But there's going to be in the uh, bin directory for the Intel compiler a PSENV, I'm sorry, a, something like a compilers underscore env.sh type of script. And you run that to set up your environment variables, and then you can compare that to what your uh, – module file looks like, but I'm going to have to save that for when we actually have compilers installed. Oh, let me do one other thing while I'm here. I'm going to do a module avail, and it's showing all the different modules that it knows about including all the individual different flavors of Intel compilers and stuff like that. All the different flavors of MPT and so forth. Now, by the way, if you are in an SGI machine and you want to get to this SGI software, it's all in slash SW. That's what we use internally. So in order for me to do this, I can do a module use slash SW slash module files. And desktop is not visible, Dev. I'm sorry? Yeah, desktop is not visible. Uh, and your desktop is not visible. Thank you. So I was trying to show that I did a module avail to see all these different modules. Now, uh, looks like. Oh, ls slash sw, and then I've got a com module file. So what you do internally is use sw com module files. And now when I do a module avail, it writes it to standard error too, not standard out. More on X. So here we're seeing the SW module module file directory. And then we can see what other module files are available on that particular machine. So again, if you don't, what they've done here in user share modules, module file, no, I'm sorry, in it and do a more on the dot modules path, they've already fixed it so that it is automatically pointing to the SW uh, com module file and the SW modules module file. But if I don't have that, then I do the use type of thing with this one right there. Okay, I'm going to do an echo of a dollar path here. So I see my home directory, which is NFS mounted first, then all these other things. I myself would get rid of a lot of this stuff. I'm not using games. I'm not using a KDE desktop. I'm not using this user lib MIT stuff. Go ahead and get rid of stuff that you don't need. Shorten your path. It can make a difference. I could even see moving my bin directory behind the other bins, 
so that if I'm doing an LS, it doesn't have to go through an NFS home first. If that NFS is bottlenecking, I'm going to have trouble with that being first in my path. Okay? So, let me go find a compiler here. Let me just try module load Intel. Um, let me find one that's going to be good for me. Let me go with uh, Intel compilers. Let me just pick this one. Okay, so I'm going to do a module load. Now if I echo dollar path, I now see that this is at the top of my path. Now if I do an ls on that directory, there are these I port. Now this is an Itanium system, so it automatically found the Itanium path for me. It, it was smart enough to do that and pointed me to this. If I were to do a source, first of all, let me do a module purge. Echo dollar path. Got rid of that stuff now. So now let me do a source. and source that thing, oops. This is where people always get into trouble. Oops, doesn't like something in there. Uh, I'm not sure that I wanna worry about that. Let's find a different one here. What the heck? Oh, I'm sorry. Let's LS that thing. So here was another version. Let me try this one. And it should complain. This is what I was looking for. What type of platform are we? The old 32 bit, x86, or Itanium? Uh, I don't really care right now. I'm just doing this as demo, but I am going to do Intel 64. Now if I echo my dollar path. Oh, I didn't even add it in there. Let's see. Probably, not sure why. Probably because I'm not on a, oh, wait a second, though. That's a IA64 path. Let me do it differently and just stick to the hardware that I've got here with the uh, IA64. Now if I echo my path, now it's in there. So I'm trying to warn you is that with Intel and Perf Suite, you're going to want to run. They'll both have some sort of bars type of script. Let me try a module load Perf Suite. And it didn't load anything there either. Uh, don't really care right now. But I was trying to get these bar scripts to see what they are setting up for a path and then make sure my module file has that in their path. That's what I was trying to do here. Kind of a bad choice when I'm on an Itanium system anyway. Well, let me get out of there. Let's move on. So I do want you to get uh, Intel compiler module in place and a Perf Suite module in place. So uh, compiling a program, a lot of people taking this class are administrators and have not ever compiled a program. So I've got GCC and G Fortran, the GNU compilers that came with SLEPs. Dash G gives me symbol tables. I need that. And we're going to go from a dash 0 to a dash 3 today and specify what the executable binary is going to be, and then the program. 
In this case, I did a module load and then ICC and IFORT. And in this example, I added a special option for the Nehalem processor here. If you're going to Sandy Bridge or Ivy Bridge coming up, there may be additional switches that you can specify. This is basically taking advantage of the uh, single instruction, multiple data, the vectorization unit that's on the processor. I'm also doing a dash parallel. That's where we're going to go first thing tomorrow is get code 2 multi-threaded. That will automatically multi-thread it and put OpenMP directives in the program for me. Or I can do my own. So dash OpenMP simply says there's already directives added into the source for OpenMP. And then ICC as well. Now for MPT, I need to load MPT, then compile it, and I have to include the library. And then I'm going to run an MPT application. You should have done that, but not multi-host. This one is running it across a couple of hosts. So this is how you run an MPI application. We need to go there tomorrow. So compiler optimization. Right now, we were at 100 seconds with no optimization with the GNU compiler. I'm just going to flip it straight to optimization level 3 to give me aggressive optimization. Now, other things that the compiler can do, this was called interprocedural optimization, IPO. We make two passes through the program. So we make notes on the program the first pass. For example, dead environment variables, dead subroutines, things of that sort. And then we use the information on the first pass to make decisions when we're going through it on the second pass. The more notes I have from the first pass will give me better decision making when I actually do the compilation. We also have profile guided optimization. This is block counting. This is actually going to add instructions to your code. So with a prof gen, we then run the program. It's going to leave a, a profile file behind. And then I compile a second time using the runtime file from the first run to make decisions about compiling on the second compilation. Now, one of the key things it's doing with profile guide and optimization is seeing what routines are calling each other. And then when we do the profile guided optimization, we're going to use the runtime block counting statistics to put routines that are calling each other on the same page. We're trying to reduce instruction TLB misses by keeping routines that call each other on the same 4K byte page, trying to reduce instruction TLB misses. So we're sorting the binary, putting commonly called routines close to each other on the same page. Another optimization of the compiler is called loop nest optimization. Now these things, this goes back to Craze, and Craze had what were called vector registers. Nowadays we call that thing a single instruction, multiple data. So I would do one instruction and then do, for example, a floating point operation on a whole stream of data. Now they still use the terminology for vectorization, which is basically trying to take my loops and use the SIMD SSE type of instruction sets on the processor, but we can't do vectorization if there are problems in the loops. So this was called loop nest optimization that might flip loops around, unroll them things of that sort. Another comment, dash G gives me symbol tables, but turns off optimization. Now, one thing that can happen, when I am at an 03, it is possible that the compiler might reorder my instructions, what's called software pipelining. I kind of mentioned it up here. Software pipeline is where we reorder the instructions to pack the instruction pipe to keep it busy. But in the process of shuffling instructions to pack the instruction pipe, we might get a timing problem and a numerical error. And then when we try to go to symbol tables, it turns off that software pipelining and the problem goes away. Now what you can do is go with a dash G and a dash O3 
find out w what routine the problem is in, and then turn off si software pipelining just for that routine and tell the compiler, don't pipeline, don't, don't software pipeline this routine because it's giving me bad data. Now, the newer architectures, the newer processors don't use software pipelining as much. Hyperthreads will keep that instruction pipe busy. And there's also register rotation and stuff like that that reduces contention on the instruction pipe. Now, the Intel compilers do give us optimization reports. If I compare to dash 0 to the dash 03, I might be able to find what it was doing that was different. So an optimization report, where it's placed, and I can do different uh, just on a particular routine and display the phases that I can do. What kind of reports do I want? Also a vectorization report. I can turn that on to see with whether loops are vectorizing or not. The default is a 1, but I could say go to a 2, which is only telling me about loops that did not vectorize and why they did not vectorize. Three gets a little bit more verbose for dependency information, and five reports on non-vectorized and adds dependency info. Five would be the one you most likely want. So profiling. This is the main thing I need to get to you to today. Gprof is the GNU profiling tool, but that won't get me down to a line number, and that won't get me to hardware counters. I've been using perf, but I want you to use perf a little bit more now. Perf is root only. Only root can run perf. PS run is what I want you to get to next. We need to get the NCSA perf suite uh, running. And uh, let me go off here for a second, share my desktop. Let me go to uh, Floyd 3 here. I'll take this one right here. By the way, this tarball can also be gotten from a support folio as a freeware download. I would not go to NCSA Perf Suite for the patch. Uh, ours is a little bit newer, and then our engineer submits patches back to the NCSA Perf Suite people. Let me copy that into your uh, root directory. Okay, let me go copy that to the other things. Uh, FFTP. Now, I'm going to do this quickly just for demo purposes. Let me make a directory here, SW. Let me make a directory for SW perp suite. Let me copy this thing now into SW perp suite. Let me go in there. I accidentally got some of my perf sample files in there too. Let me gun zip this thing. Let me untar it. Now I don't like the way he did this. It's going to untar in my current directory and I don't like that. So let me remove all this stuff. Let me do a maker of 1A5 for example. Copy my perf suite file here. Now let me uh, untar that thing. I'll remove this when I'm done, but now I've got a decent directory.
directory here. I'm, I've got to run this dot slash install. And he does have a PDF file here nowadays. Oops, didn't like something. Wrong shell. Let me get to the C shell here. That looks clean now. And what that thing is doing is setting up again, this is what I was talking about, this PSENV script. So if I do a source of that PSENV, echo my dollar path, I can now see where my things are. And then I can create a, uh, let me go into uh, SW module files I don't have yet. Make their, and then copy. Uh, oops, wrong location. Uh, let's move perp suite slash SW module files. Now let me edit that thing. Oops. So same sort of thing here, except my path is going to be a little bit different. I'm in Perf Suite One Five A. Let's go down and see what we got going here. Lib bin path man path. And I do expect a bug here right now. So, let me just go here. Uh, let me go into home guest, real WL. Let me do a G Fortran dash O3. Let me just use uh, A dot out. All it, I want symbol tables. Let me try PS run uh, dot slash a dot out. Looks like it's running. Now when it's done, it's going to leave an XML file behind. It took about 20 seconds last time we counted this. There we are. So there's the XML file describing it. Now let me do a PS process on that XML file, type it into more. So here I can see the file I'm looking at, the PID that it was at, the name of the program, clock of the CPU, cache characteristics. Now I'm clocking every time I get 10,000 clock ticks. Every time I get 10,000 clock ticks, I sample where the program counter was. Again, it was right around 20 seconds, 21 seconds in this example. And then when I look at it, this is what I want you to be able to see today. C length is the top routine, and XD read is the second top routine. And then I'm also down to a line number, and see XD read is actually taking 294 samples. Okay, so I was just quickly demonstrating that. Let me go back to the workbook. Uh, we've used S-Trace. PMAP you have to be careful of. It's been broken, but PMAP will show you what, what libraries have been linked into a process. PMAP is for running processes. LDD would be for the binary. 
LDD will show me what DSO is going to look for. Then we've got DLOOK. I want to check something here for a second. Uh, I was hoping that DLOOK would have been, uh, let's see, RPM-QL. Hang on a second. Yeah, DLOOK isn't showing up on my system, or DLOOK summary is not showing up on my system yet. Anyway. There is what I was looking for is a dlook-summary that has been integrated now. Right now it's in my bin directory, and I want to use that as we go along for memory affinity information. So, program uh, sampling versus block counting. With block counting, we're using that dash pro underscore gen. Uh, with the GNU compiler, it's a different syntax. It's like a dash PG. And we run the code, and then we use the second compilation with Profuse to use the info that the first run gave. And this is counting number of calls each subroutine, and this one's basically sorting the subroutines to put commonly called routines on the same page. Now with sampling, I'm periodically checking where the program counter is. This does include libraries, but libraries are making the system call. We can get an increase in system time. Also SI time. I kind of hope to ha hit that, but SI time if I interrupts. determines the number of time each subroutine was on the stack and the time spent in each subroutine. The count included user time and system time. It does include memory access time. So the first uh, lab was to do a G4TRAN-PG for profile guided. And uh, then we're going to run the program. And that program has been instrumented and has binary added to it around each subroutine, the block count. When that program is done running, it has left behind a gmon.out file. So when I do a gprof, specify where my symbol tables are and where the experiment sample file is, I get a gmon sum, and then I did a more on that. And again, I can see clint at the top of the list, and then xd read, and then state. And we'll also get into the caller or callee, how many times each subroutine called the other subroutines. Uh, I think now is a good time for a break. Let's take a 15-minute break. For me, it would be 20 to the hour. Okay. So let's come back in 15 minutes. Okay. So we need to profile code two and get down to the line numbers where it's spending time. But then we also want to start looking at hardware counters to figure out non-productive hardware events, such as cast misses, TOB misses, things of that sort. So understanding the processor block diagram. Now I kind of want to uh, share my desktop here for a second. And uh, let's see here. I'm going to go to Google. one I want. One of the things that you're going to be interested in when you get to this level is David Leventhal. I'm looking for a particular manual here. Here we are. 
Performance Analysis Guide for Core i7 Processor. Anything from David Leventhal is good to describe the architecture of the system. Here's the manual. It's going to describe the architecture, explain the instruction pipes, all that sort of thing. And also, in the end of it, gets into the hardware counters themselves. Some of the derived metrics and stuff like that that he does. So let me back up here. This performance analysis guide for Intel i7 processors from David Leventhal. All they did was a search in i7 David Leventhal. So the next piece comes out of this portion of his materials. Anybody need to make, take notes on that? We'll come back to that then. So this is looking at the Nehalem. Westmere is going to be a little different. Sandy Bridge is a little bit different, but they have the same basic concept. So we have four cores, and if hyperthreads are on, that's eight CPUs. Each core has its own private L1 and L2 caches. L1 is separated between instruction and data. Again, L2 is sharing the two of them, but is not shared with the other cores on the socket. But then we have what's called the L3 cache, also referred to as the last level cache. Let me kind of put that down here. also referred to as the uncore, stuff that's not part of the core. And this is shared between all cores or all eight CPUs. Then also coming off the socket, we have the uh, memory controller and the quick path interconnect tying to other sockets. This now and I don't have this for Ivy Bridge or Sandy Bridge. This is the last one I have. It's basically showing the Nehalem architecture, mostly the instruction decode process. So somewhere up here is memory. When we load an instruction, the instruction goes into the shared L3 cache. Then we go into the L2 cache. Then we're into the instruction L1 cache. And we have an instruction TOB. And again, that profile guided optimization was trying to sort these so that we reduce the TOB misses between the segments of instructions, jumping between routines. Now, out of that instruction cache, then there is a pre decode buffer that's going to figure out we have looks like 18 instruction queues, 18 different instruction pipes. Depending upon the instruction, they're going to go into different types of decoders. So, for example, floating point operations take longer. They're going to be complex decoders. Now, we are using a term here called a micro operation. Basically, an instruction will take more than one clock period, and each of the clock periods to complete the instruction is called a micro operation. One of the things we try to do is reduce no micro ops. On Itanium systems, they used to call that a bubble. A bubble or a no micro op says there is a clock period in the instruction pipe where nothing is being done. And that's where things like software pipelining came into place to shuffle things around and impact that instruction pipe to reduce the number of wasted clock periods or no micro ops. We're going to look at some hardware counters, and that would be one of the things we'd be interested in. From there, then, it gets into what's called a reservation station. And depending upon type of instruction, we've got six ports here, zero through five. And then if it's an aromatic, arith arithmetic logical unit or a shift, it goes into that one. Floats go into that one. And shuffles and ALUs go into port one. Port two are for three other types of functional units, port five for these, 
And then port two, three, and four are for memory references. So we've got like six ports here with multiple types of functional units that we want to keep all these things busy at the same time, which means overlapping, reordering, shuffling, and trying to pack the instruction pipe to keep it busy. In other words, reduce no micro-ops and make sure every clock period, every one of these pipes has something happening. The blade then, we have a Nehalem, or nowadays a Sandy Bridge with its own private memory for each thing. This is a node. This is what I've been referring to as a node, a socket, a processor, a package, all the same thing. These two sockets then plug into the hub. And here's my directory memory for cache coherency for CC NUMA that contains a bit mask of everything that's sharing a cache line. Now, if this was UV2, we would not have quick path interconnect between the sockets. They would be separate sockets and separate motherboards on that, uh, actually a triple board blade, three boards to the blade one for each socket and one for the hub, now called the harp. And instead of four ports coming off the hub, we have 16 ports coming off the harp. So a shove, a hub, a harp, or different names, bedrock, different names for the same concept of something that is switching from a Intel protocol to a SGI NumaLink protocol. And that hub is an SGI proprietary chip. Also nowadays, the I.O. riser, the PCI is coming off the socket. So you don't have two sockets tying into the PCI stuff. You only get one of the uh, processors. P the uh, PCI is straight off the socket now without going through QPI. That way we don't saturate this socket. If I'm trying to do I.O. and I'm trying to keep this busy with work, I don't want my I.O. to get into there. I'd rather push my I.O. across and reduce contention on the quick path interconnect that might be here. So this hub, we're going to get into this in detail tomorrow. We've been looking at statistics on it already. We've got four pieces to it. The socket interface is what connects to quick path interconnect. So this is what's giving the SGI proprietary protocol. It used to be called a front side bus. And it's converting CC NUMA into Snoop Cache for the Intel processor. Then we have a local home portion of this processor. And this is managing directory memory. So we have directory memory attached to this. This is what's keeping track of my cache line state. This is where I'm figuring out the state information is saying what CPUs are sharing my cache line. So if I do modify something, the snoop lines coming off a of quick path interconnect are going to go to the local home piece and maintain things within the directory memory to say these are the CPUs that are sharing. We also have remote home, and this is what's actually sending the coherency protocol to the other heart other shoves in the system, sending an intervention and an invalidation. The third piece coming off of this shove or harp is the programming interface, the ABI. So the local block is what we get in to program the chip and debug the chip. There's a command called UVDMP, UV dump, is simply going into the local block and dumping registers of the chip. So this uh, L block is the software ABI to select, configure, control various functions, test it. We can monitor when I'm getting PCP statistics that we had earlier today. I was monitoring NumaLink traffic from it. LinkStat UV is getting from it. We've got diagnostics. We've got UV dump. And there are a couple other things in here. Something called the BAU or the Broadcast Accelerator Unit. This is primarily for TOB misses, 
so that we don't have to go to a pace table. This is meant to maintain coherency of TLB buffers across the system. If a page were to get swapped out and then get read back into memory to a different address, we've got to make sure that the TOBs across the system are coherent with that change. And another thing I'm glad that finally happened, something called the MOE, the MPI offload engine. This is an interprocessor uh, interrupt capability. This is for barrier synchronization. Normally, the way MPI, for example, Intel MPI cannot use this MOE, Intel MPI is sitting there reading a region in memory. All the ranks or threads of the MPI application are writing to this memory region to say what they're doing. So every time I check my barrier and do the, are you done, are you done, are you done, I would normally be going to memory to do that, which, number one, ties up memory. Number two, has latency effects to it. So now we have an interprocessor interrupt capability called the MOE, and now instead of sitting there going, are you done, are you done, are you done, we can send a uh, interprocessor interrupt to the other CPU and say, hey, I'm talking to you, are you done yet? Now some of this stuff is often referred also to the GRU, so this uh, API sometimes is referred to as a GRU as well. But the GRU is really a separate unit. The GRU is a memory-to-memory -memory copy. It's meant to do copies without using the CPUs. Normally, for example, if I am copying from one rank to the other, there will be a mem copy routine in the kernel, and that's going to read the memory addresses into cache on the processor and then write them back off to the new memory address. So that pollutes the memory, pollutes the cache, I mean, on the chip, and also, um, well, anyway, the GRU would reduce CPU load to do that and reduce cache pollution on the processor for that. Uh, if you had origin background, it used to be called a block transfer engine. And back in those days, the block transfer engine would do memory-to-memory -memory transfers for page cache as well. On an Origin 2000, by rote to disk, it would go from user space to kernel space, and that was the block transfer engine doing that. Right now, the block transfer engine on the UV called the GRU is only being used by MPT or UPC, the Unified Parallel C, which is a layer on top of MPT. Okay. The uh, hub for uh, UV2 looks a little bit different, but it's same, basically the same thing. But you have like two hemispheres. You've got two things that are in there. I do need to get a better version of this for the UV2. Now we're going to have to start looking at those statistics tomorrow. We were today. We were looking at the Numalink traffic. So here I was talking about the instruction pipe. If I don't have hyperthreads, I've got two processes. This one got loaded into the pipe, and this is only showing four instruction pipes, whereas we were looking at 16 instruction pipes on an earlier drawing. And then each of these things would be a clock period or a micro operation. And the blues indicate something is scheduled for that clock period and a micro operation occurring. And these light-colored boxes are a bubble or a no-op or a no-micro operation. In other words, nothing is happening during that clock period. So, for example, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 15, 15. I've got 18 no-micro ops in this example. But because they have hyperthreads turned on, the two threads can interleave and overlap, reducing the need for software pipelining and shuffling. Now instead of 18, I see six no micro ops. Another thing to keep in mind is this blue, if this process were to suddenly say a branch is needed right here, then there are going to be a whole bunch of instructions that are thrown away, and then we've got to wait time for the instruction pipes to get reloaded for the next thread. 
if it's hyper-threaded, we can get rid of those, but we don't have to wait as long to load up our pipe because we still got things that are queued up in that pipe that are in the process of issuing. And by the way, entering into the pipe is an issue, and leaving the pipe is a retire. If I enter the pipe as an issue and I don't retire, that more likely means I took a branch and an instruction that was put into the pipe was mispredicted branch, and therefore, when we did take the branch, everything that got preloaded is no longer needed and thrown away. That would be an instruction pipeline flush. And then we got to wait a certain number of clock periods for that instruction pipe to get filled up again and packed with instructions. So by using SMT, we're able to optimize my instructional units, hide my memory latency, but we still have sharing between the TOBs, the caches, and the bandwidth off the memory. Now it gets real messy at this point because hardware counter access has only been standard since SLES 11 SP1. Back in SLES 10, HP Hewlett Packard had an interface known as PFMON, PERFMON. They had a command named PFMON. So it was known as the PERFMON interface, and it was a special kernel. Now, SLES integrated that into the IA64 kernel, but not the x86 kernel. So back in SLES 10, SGI had its own kernel with PERFMON interfaces in it, and then we had a HISTEX and LibPFPM interface to read that stuff, as well as the standard HP command PFMON. Then in SLES 11, it got re-implemented, known as PERFMON 2, still HP-based, uh, still a SLES kernel, but both SLES kernels, x86 and IE64, now had hardware counters. And the interface, instead of being a slash PROC, was through slash SYS. And at this point, by the way, with the uh, newer kernels and everything, we started using NCSA's PS Run on Itanium. We never wanted to re-implement or report the HISTEX stuff. Too much work for it. But then in SLES 11 SP2, the Linux community came up with a system call interface that standardized 2.6.33 and higher. They also integrated and have to have PAPI, but PAPI might have to be built for that particular OS. One of the advantages of grabbing the perf suite tarball that I showed you is that Pappy has been built and integrated into that correctly. I've seen Pappies on Red Hat and Celeste that were not built correctly and were not using the PCL interface. So basically the Pappies that I've seen with Red Hat and Celeste were not usable. They could only get the clock ticks. So once we got into PAPI, we have a PAPI avail command, and I need to show you that and start demoing that. That will show me what hardware counters I can profile from. And then I've got PERF, and with PERF, I can actually track and see how many TLB misses I took. And then with PS Run, I can also start doing experiments to say, where was I for all my TLB misses? Also, I have an experiment called a PERFX report that will look at multiple hardware counters at the same time. So once I've got my application down to a line number and I'm making sure that it's vectorized and all that sort of stuff, I then want to start looking for non-productive hardware events, TLB misses, cache misses, instruction pipeline flushes, no micro ops. There's about 30 hardware counters that we're interested in. So PAPI, again, grab it from the Perf Suite Tarball built by SGI. Here's the URL for it. It's a library interface to get the hardware counters. Again, advantage, it runs on many vendors. One interface for the programmer. But uh, it's really not a UV issue, but if we run Sandy Bridge or uh, Ivy Bridge coming out, we may not have full access to all hardware counters. There are some hardware counters on the Halem that are not fully implemented in PAPI. 
and I didn't have any documentation or man pages at the time. I had to go off to the PAPI website for that. So the first command. Now I talk about for PCP data, we had PM info dash T to show me all my PCP statistics. Then I had task stats, task logger, and get delays to show me all my per process statistics for accounting. Now Pappy Vale is giving me all the hardware counters that I can profile on. And the first column is a generic hardware general. It doesn't matter what the hardware software is. A Pappy L1 ICM would be the same on a Cray as it is on an SGI or an IBM. So we get the name of the Pappy event, a code, whether it is derived or not. By derived, we mean we added a couple of numbers together. And then the name of the event. Not all of them are available. I then did a Pappy Avail dash D that would show me my events, and I've just got one event visible here that I'm going to look at. The Pappy L1 ICM, that's level one instruction cache misses. It is not derived, and the actual hardware counter is an L1I colon misses. Now that native hardware counter event might be different on Westmere or Sandy Bridge or Ivy Bridge. The cores that you've got are going to have different native hardware counter events. This is something that you would look up on the Intel website or in that David Leventhal manual that will describe all of these uh, hardware counter events. So we're mapping that native processor event to a generic PAPI event. There's also a PAPI native avail, which is just kind of giving you a little bit more information about each and what they're doing. LLC being last level or L3 caches. Moving on, PCL, everything is performance counters for Linux now. Been using it for several years. It is now a Linux community solution used by Perf, used by Pappy, and NCSA Perf Suite uses Pappy. Now, there's no more PFMON from SLEC. That is gone. But SGI, we have our own little command called show EBT info and check events. Those are in the SGI Perf Suite Tarball. By the way, I don't mean the SGI Perf Suite product set. I mean the NCSA Perf Suite Tarball that is tarred up by an SGI engineer. I kind of hated it when they reused the name Perf Suite when this major product out there already. So if you're used to using PFMON, the counterpart to it is show event, show EBT info and check events. But those are built by a guy named Daniel Thomas that's in the per suite tarball that you can get from uh, get from me, get from Daniel Thomas. Or there might be, I don't know the latest version, but there's going to be a version on support folio, but it not, might not be the latest, which came out about a month ago. So there's no more HISTEX or Profile PL. It's a system call interface, no more PROC or SIS interface. And I-64 is different in its implementation. So I've been using the perf command quite a bit. I really like it. However, it has its dangers. Slash 11 SP1 with uh, uh, threads going on with OpenMP threads, it could deadlock your system where you can't even NMI it. You can't even get a dump out of it. All you can do is a power reset. So perf help. Let's see what we got here. I can list my events that I want to look at. I've been using record and report. I can look at scheduler statistics. I can look at generic statistics as well. And I've also been using top. So with a perf record, I can record on a particular event. That's where I can use show event info to get my event number. I want to demonstrate that. I can specify a PID or a thread ID. Uh, I was using A for all samples. 
I can profile to a particular CPU to watch it. And here's the hard thing now, the count. If I have a large CPU system with a lot of threads running, I don't want to over-instrument things. If I start thrashing on the interrupts to do the profiling, I've got to slow down the profiling, get a bigger, bigger number. So I am hoping that I have some SI time when I demonstrate this tomorrow, when I start profiling multi-threading applications, and I'm going to have to increase the count. Also on a big memory system, I might have to increase my open file limit. I might have to use the U limit or the limit command to increase the number of files I can have open. And also, uh, the frequency I want to profile at. And lastly, there are times that PERF will tell you I need more memory map pages to keep running. So let's see how it goes when I start getting into multi-threading tomorrow. And then I did a PERF report. Again, I could have specified an output file. I did that once this week. There we are, the output file, and then I can specify an input file. But I've been pretty lazy just using the default of perf.data. And then in the report, I don't know, I wasn't using much of these, show per thread counters. I was using the dash dash pretty with a standard I.O., FDD I.O., get rid of all that MS-DOS curses type of stuff. And we could also, again, I was using the G option to get my call graph. So our main job today is to get into code 2 itself and do a perf record on it. Then I did a perf report on that code 2 samples. And again, I want you to see CLint, XD, read, and state at the top of the list. This one here simply means I don't know the address of, of it. No symbol table for it. I do see some scheduler ticks, some other things down at the bottom of the list. There is a perf list command, so these are the defaults that I can track on. So I can just get basics and say, just track where I'm taking L1 instruction cache lows, or maybe I want to uh, I'm not seeing L2 here. There's probably more down here for L2 data cache misses. Uh, minor page faults. Where are my TLB misses occurring from? Where am I going to swap? Track context switches, things of that sort. Alignment faults are relevant. Everything is important to be able to align to cache line boundaries. We don't want an item, an object, for example, a floating point number to cross the 64-byte cache line. We want everything aligned to that 64-byte boundary. So here I did a perf stat on code 2, and then we can get some general statistics, page faults, clock periods, instruction misses, cache misses, things of that sort. And that's where we were with 99 seconds. Now here I did the perf command, and now I'm just looking at the report. So again, I can see CLint, XD, read, and state at the top of the list. Now, I did not use STDIO on this, so it's got kind of a, a, the uh, curses type of hidden characters in there. Then I did a perf report on this one. Same thing, CLIND, XD, read, and state. Now, moving on, to get to my hardware counter, show event info is a replacement for PFMON. And... I kind of just snip things here to show that I'm on in the halum. And there were 119 events that were supported there. And what I'm looking for is the code to be able to profile from. Oh, did I see it back here? Uh, not really showing it here. What I was looking for is there is a dash E capability. So you can do a dash E space R and then the event number. So I'm looking for this event number. Also did a show event info dash capital L and then I can see all the events. 
that are available through the Perfmon PAPI interface. Now I did a show event info and grep for mem load. So here, for example, are my data TOB load misses. Anytime I had to load the cache, did not have the address, and had to take a data TLB miss for it. I also did a show event info on mem instructions retired. By the way, here's one that's nice. I can profile and say every time I get a memory reference that exceeds a latency threshold, tell me where I am. Get me my program counter and stuff. So here, mem instruction retired has a hex B, and then I have to figure out if I want loads or stores. If I want loads, then I'm going to put a zero one in there. So let me see what this looks like now. So I then did a check events, and I can see some of my different events here. Don't really care about them. I'm looking for the code here. There's also a show off core showing some of the hardware statistics we can get off the L3 last level cache. And so here's now what I was trying to get to. I did a check events. This time I'm actually looking for my snoop cache, my false cache sharing, my cache coherency counter. And its code is this 530F40. So I did a perf stat dash E and then the R and then the code that I was able to get from right here. And then when it was done, these were the number of events that that hardware counter went through. I then did actually two counters, and here was the second one. I should be able to get up to 32 of these things on a command line. Okay. So NC says perf suite, no histex anymore. It's one tool for all platforms. I'm use <coughs> excuse me. I used it last week on a XE system. I use it on ice clusters all the time. The hard part is making sure you got a kernel that's supporting it. NC say perf suite uses Pappy and it does support with the latest kernel multiple hardware counter access. Again, in the workbook, this is a little bit old for a rev level. I'm at 15A right now. Here's the website for the uh, product, but again, I would use our tarball. <coughs> so I want you to be able to profile here, run i port dash g. Do your PS run with code 2 as a child. When it's done, it will save an XML file. You then do a PS process on that XML file. And then here's what I just did before break. From that PS process, I can see CLint, XD read, and state at the top of the list. Now, since I had symbol tables on, I can also see it by line number. This is the line number over here. So I got 1,018 clock ticks that showed 2486 being the line number that I was spending time in. Let me back up for a second. So it looks like I got about 10,000 samples. Every time I got 10,000 clock ticks, I sampled and that happened 10,000 times, giving me a 100-second run for the process. So out of that, 1,000 of them were at this line here. Now, I don't know if you're noticing this. Sealant is at the top of the list here with 6,775 events. XD read is second in the list. Down here... XD read is the top of the list. I got 1,000 samples, so 12% of my CPU time is spent in this line 2486. That's an XD read. 
not sealant. Sealant has a bunch of little loops in it. So when you add up all these 500, 500, 500, that gets you up to almost 7,000 samples in sealant. But sealant is composed of a bunch of small little loops. You do have to be careful. Sometimes they might be, for example, here, 1892 and 1880 might actually be the same loop, depending upon where you are in the loop. So now I'm down to line numbers, and then I can look at the code to figure out what's going on with that code. Now, I need to demonstrate this tomorrow. I'm kind of getting ready to wrap up here for the day. But I want to get into experiment files. And in this one, I created an experiment file that is doing by native hardware events. And then I've listed the show event info events that I want to track. Then I ran my program. Then I got a process report. And then when I reported on it, I can now see raw counter values. I'm going to do this tomorrow with a row versus column, TLB miss type of experiment. Uh, let me go off and share my desktop while I'm here. So we've got a whole bunch of experiments in here. These are the ones that came by default. I want to copy a couple of mine. And I've got some other examples in here. Let me copy the uh, TOB one. Oops. And also let me copy the uh, all sharing one. So if I take a look at the TOB one, all I'm doing is that data TOB misses any. If I look at the fault sharing one, I'm looking at a hardware counter known as L2 M lines out any, which has to do with cache coherency, CC NUMA type of events. I could have also looked at another one, but that's the one that this experiment is working on right now. Another experiment file I have here that perfects this one is actually using PAPI events instead of the native. So notice this other one uh, was a native hardware event. And by the way, this one's going to trap every time I get a TLB miss. That's going to be a problem. I'll prove that tomorrow. I need to get that threshold bigger than that. At a one, I'm going to get an interrupt for every one of these things, and my SI time is going to go crazy from that, being too aggressive in my sampling. This one, then, is actually doing the PAPI events, and there are 32 of them. So let me go into home. First of all, I'm going to do a source of slash SW, perf suite, perf... Uh, PSEMD.SH. Now, I haven't finished testing the module file to see if that works. I'm just using this one. Now, let me do a PS run. And this time, I'm going to do an experiment dash C. And I got to put in the SW perf suite sum. I'm going to do that perfx experiment dot slash A dot out. That's the uh, code, too, that I compiled earlier. So what it's doing right now is sampling 32 hardware counters, all of these different things here.
uh, last week on a uh, Overtown processor, I had to go in and change my Perfex report to remove some of the hardware events that were not available. Let me do a Pappy underscore avail. So I have uh, 63 events available, 17 of them are derived. So here's each of those Pappy events we were talking about and what they mean, whether they're available, and whether they're derived or not. Let me do a dash D. So here was the one we were, let's see, not seeing any of those. Here's one that's actually derived. This Pappy L2 DCM, level two data cache misses, is taking these two native hardware events. Again, that David Leventhal manual on I7 architecture will get you into these in more detail. Unfortunately, the one that I really want is this one. Request for an exclusive access to a shared cache line. That's the false cache sharing one, and that's not available in this PAPI mapping right now. TOB misses, things of that sort. So this is what's actually going to tell me what hardware event this is mapped to or defined as. Now, I, LS-LT had, oops. let me do a PS process on this file that I just generated here. Type it into more. And now I can start to see raw values. Now, the thing here is these numbers are not very friendly. It's hard to see commas in there, get your decimal places right. When I was on IRIX, IRIX would actually, with their Perfects report, give me a timetable over on the right and give me an approximate time spent on these values and then actually sort it from the most time-consuming hardware event to the least time-consuming consuming hardware event. I could go off to a site, see a program that had been running for a day or two, attached to it with the Perfex utility, and then see that it's stuck in a barrier or stuck in false cache sharing or taking data TOB misses, things of that sort. So one of the things that we want to be looking at tomorrow and Friday is my data TOB misses. Here's my floating point information, things of that sort. And then at the end, we get some derived metrics. Okay, let me go back to my uh, workbook here. So I was trying to show you that I've got a couple other examples of experiments that I wrote. This one was a native hardware event one, and then I had a multiple PAPI event one. So here's what that Perfects report looked like. Again, these raw values are hard to convert into time domain. When you're tuning, you want to track total cycles here, and you want to see that one go down, and also things like data TOB misses go down, cache misses go down, things of that sort. I don't have any false cache sharing events available to me here within PAPI. And then you get your summary report. I wonder if I can find something here. Okay. I have done something in the past. Let me try finding one here. I don't know if this is going to load. Yeah, it does. What I have done here is I have run code two. I've got 60,000 runs of code two. Code two was run 60,000 times. Over on the left, I ran one concurrent copy 20 times then two concurrent copies 20 times, then three, then four, then five. 
You might have seen me using this go dot bottle script, and the purpose of that is for me to measure a bottleneck and in a controlled fashion increase the number of concurrent copies. And then I've taken all these Perfects reports. I'm looking at 60,000 Perfects reports. I can do this overnight tonight if we want. The blue is my clock periods. The red are my functional units that are stalling because they're busy. And then I've got cash misses and TLB misses down here. And what I'm looking for is a correlation. And I can immediately see that when my, by the way, right here is where we hit hyperthreads. This is where we ran out of physical CPUs, and these are the virtual CPUs, and right here is where I ran out of CPUs. So if this was a 64 CPU system with hyperthreads, this is the point at which 32 threads were running. This is the point at which 64 threads were running. And above that, I had oversubscribed my CPUs. Now, in this case, on this system, this report, I was anywhere from 18 seconds, or I'm sorry, these are by cycles, clock periods, not by seconds. So I'm going from 18 million cycles up to 60 million cycles. Look at the one right here, and it directly correlates to the stalls on the functional unit. Let me see if I can find another one that's interesting in here. Go with this one. Here I can see cache misses, L1 cache misses, L2 cache misses. Here is where I ran out of physical cores and started going into hyperthreads, and you can see the immediate effect of sharing the cache between the two hyperthreads on the same core. And then right here is where I have more threads than CPUs. And I kind of drilling down into everything here. I wanted one by seconds. Let's see. Well, it doesn't look. Here's the same program again. It went anywhere from nine seconds up to 30 seconds for the same calculation. And from the other perfect data, I could see that it was related to the red one here, which was the stalls. So what I'm trying to show here is contention on a core when multiple threads are sharing the same core, even the hyper threads sharing the same core. And I'm running this thing wide open in the system. If you look down here, we got a whole bunch of bumps before I hit hyper threads. That is just from the operating system noise. Let me try this one here. So here's where I hit hyperthreads. Here's where I hit the total number of CPUs on the system. But you can see some phases in here where things were thrashing around. Nothing was pinned. Nothing was pinned. So the CPU scheduler was thrashing me around all the time. And then up here is where I basically ran out of CPUs again. So by using that perfect data, I can find a correlation between a change in my CPU runtime and what hardware event is causing it. So all I did was plot my perfects data. All I did was take this and plot it and look for contention issues. Let's move on. Uh, I do have a problem. PS process doesn't really handle multiple counter reports. I usually just pick one at a time. Also, when we're profiling tomorrow, if I am dealing with a, a pthread application, I have to profile with the dash p to follow pthreads. And if it's MPI, I got to profile with the dash f to follow forks. So some of the key events that I'm going to look for, cache misses. There are a lot of different reasons for cache misses. I also want to do TLB misses. I've got a row versus column example out there that we'll do on Friday. I want to look for instruction pipeline flushes, branch mispredictions, stalls. That was the big one that we just saw. 
and also things like long memory latency references. So what causes cache misses? First of all, my stride, row versus column. I'm going to get into this tomorrow as an example demo, but there is a matrix A and a matrix, oops, it's lowercase, matrix B dot F. One is rows, one is columns. You go to my desktop here. Matrix A and matrix B, let me do a diff of them. The only difference is how they stride through the data, rows versus columns, JI versus IJ. So let me run two of these in the background. Let me do a PS run dash C slash SW perf suite rev level sum perf X uh, dot slash matrix Put that in the background. Let me compare it to B. Take a look at top. So there's my matrix A, matrix B. Looks like they're about 63 meg in memory. Hundred percent CPUs, they're not waiting on anything, but that doesn't mean they're productive. Waiting for these to finish here. Oh, one just finished. Matrix A finished first at 35 seconds of CPU time. And now Matrix B finished. Compare the difference. One was 35 seconds, one was 43 seconds. Let me separate out system time. So it wasn't really, there was a little bit more system time on the first one it looks like, but 43 seconds versus 34 seconds. All my last time was CPU service time. So let's take a look at the reports here. So I'm going to do a PS process. Let's do A first, type it into more. I want to look at data TLB misses. So A, data TLB misses, I got 200, 236,000 data TLB misses that occurred. Let's try, I think that was A, let's try B now. So we were in the 230,000, was it? Let's double check here. 236,000. Now with the B, which took longer, data data TLB misses were 700,000, not 300,000. They went up, and that's the majority of the uh, the time difference between them was on TLB misses. Now what I'm going to do is run my experiment again, uh, but this time I want to use the TLB experiment here. And we'll just run it here. By the way, let's see what's going on here. Interrupt handle time looks okay. A little bit of system time. Just waiting for it to finish. Should be close to finishing now. Should finish any time now. Let me quit out of here. Let's 
54 seconds is where we're supposed to be. Well, it's taking longer this time on the B. So we're already over 60 seconds on this run. I do have to be a little careful because we are profiling, and the profiling can take time too, particularly because I'm profiling on every TLB miss that's occurring. Is it finished now? Still not finished. I have to actually wait for it to finish to get the report or it won't work. If I just kill it or abort it, I will not get a report. I wonder if I do a perf, a report, or a record, dash P on uh, 32362, perf report. So I can see that it's spending all of its time in Maine. And this routine doesn't, this uh, thing doesn't have a whole lot other than a main routine. So I'm still uh, quite a bit slower here. Probably should have compared a matrix A to a matrix B here. Let me try a perf top dash P32362. Well, I see some pappy work going on in there, interrupt handler time. But again, everything is basically in main. That thing is still running. So it does have system time associated with it. 60% of it is system time here. So that's that 1.2% on a 62 CPU system. Uh, let's see here. Let's trace it. 32362. Oh, it looks like it's finished now. Just missed it. So let's take a look at that experiment now, PS process. Oops, let me get the uh, file first. I was kind of looking to see what it was sampling on, page sizes, things like that. Oh, here we are. Here's the profile information. So that run actually took 235 seconds. We were trapping on data TLB misses. The problem was the period was every TLB miss. And that happened 358,000 times here. And then I see... By subroutine, they were all in matrix B. And then by line number, oh, it looks like I don't have it compiled with uh, symbol tables. So the function was matrix, but I don't actually have a line number in there. Oh, here we are. Sorry. That was by function. Here's the line number now. So it's spending all of its time on lines 29 and 30. Line 30 is where it's taking all the data TLB misses. Okay. So I just quickly did show a row versus column example using matrix A, matrix B. There's a lab for that on Friday. Cache misses due to busting. When my data is bigger than the cache, the compiler is going to do what's called blocking. 
Again, everything is to get my data into cash and do everything on it while it's in cash. So if I have a terabyte array and an 18 meg L3 cache, I'm not going to load 18 meg. If I'm going to do an add, subtract, multiply, and divide, I'm not going to do the add on the entire terabyte array, then come back and do the multiply and then the divide. I'm going to load in a block of the array and do all operations on that block before I move on to the next block. That's automatically being done by the compilers. Again, if I can keep and stay on chip, on core, on cache, I don't see memory latency, I don't see NUMA latency. You get what's called a super linear speed up when your problem fits on the core. The other problem that we need to talk about briefly tomorrow, cache thrash. This is what I referred to as spec associativity. So when I was looking at the cache characteristics, by the way, let me do an edit. X86 info can give me information about the processor. Actually, I was looking for cache line information. But let me do a topology dash all. And now I can see the size of the different caches. Again, these are in powers of two. But I'm not getting set to associativity yet. So I'm going to grep slash sys devices system node CPU cache. Nope, oh, didn't look right. CPU Try that one. There we are. Let me just go to the top here. So I was going into this directory. There's an index directory. We were in this the other day. So looking at my L3 cache right here, my cache line size is 64 bytes. Itanium, it was 128. This is the L3 cache. I basically have 1,228 lines sets of data that I'm working with here. These are the CPUs that are on that processor sharing that last level cache. And here's by Bitmask. It's an 18 meg cache and it's 24 set to associativity, which says when I take, I can keep track of 24 addresses that have the same least significant bits and I will have 24 tag capabilities to keep track of what they are. If I was four ways that's associative, like up here, and I take four arrays, add them together to create a fifth array, that's five arrays, and the elements might possibly have the, be on powers of two and have the same least significant bits for the first element of each array. So one of the advices here to avoid the hardware sensitivity to powers of two is to avoid a power of two. Instead of a 1024, make it 1025. Or pad between the arrays so that the arrays skew such that the first element of each array has a different least significant bit. And also worrying about alignment align commands to be able to get my items to align to a cache line. We don't want a floating point to cross that 64-byte cache line boundary or anything. So set associativity says how many least significant addresses I can keep track of. Another thing that we're going to have to deal with tomorrow, scheduler noise. First of all, we just saw the noise from hyperthreads. I was showing you the perfects data, showing you when hyperthreads and cache misses start going up. If I have no hertz on, there is a single thread running around doing CPU scheduling. And a large CPU loaded system, that thing can be a problem and start banging into your applications. So we turn no hertz off, going back to a 256 clock tick per second interrupt. 
to wake up the CPU scheduler. That kind of spreads it out evenly across the CPUs. Other scheduler noise are all your system stuff, your check config daemons, your interrupts, any kernel threads, even K swap D coming into the memory trim is going to be noise on your process. And another one that we're going to talk about tomorrow is fault sharing. Also refers to the hot cache line. You have multiple threads writing. That's the key thing. They're writing, which means everybody that has a copy of it has to be coherent to it. In there, what, one of the things you try to do is organize your variables. I'm not going to go read, write, read, write, read, write. I'm going to do read, 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 and then pad, and then put the write on the next cache line, and then pad, and then put the next write variable on the next cache line. I would like to decouple the hot objects that are on the cache line. Push them onto the next cache line by putting a pad statement. That's something that the kernel developers are doing all the time. As our CPUs get bigger, as we get more and more CPUs, there's more contention in the kernel, and they're looking for hot cache lines in the kernel and lock contention in the kernel to try to reduce kernel system time. So I'm done for the day. Fix your code first. That's what we're trying to do now is figure out what's going on with the program. I want you to be able to get down to line numbers, and I want you to be able to profile and use perf and PS run. Then I want you to get into hardware counters and play with the uh, Pappy Avail, the PS run perfx report, show event info, check event info. We will review that tomorrow morning. Let's see here. Again, the key lab for you today is finishing, finishing up anything that you haven't done, but really important, I need to have everybody get Intel installed on their system so I can do OpenMP tomorrow. Set up your module file and then profile code 2 with gprof. Check out Pappy Avail to figure out what counters are available and what native event they map to. Use perf to profile an application. Use PS run to profile an application. Find the top four line numbers in code two. Then I want to get the hardware counters and do that PS run with the perfects report. I just did one successfully. And also profile using the hardware counters that perf and PS run can give me. And that's it.